Local broadcast of The Joy of Painting is made possible by our members in partnership with the Prescott House Nursing Home, located in North Andover, Massachusetts, and owned and operated by the... Each year we at WGBH join our colleagues on an exciting shopping trip to the annual program fair, where both American and international producers display their finest works for television. We then purchase the best programs we can with money from the WGBH annual program fund. Now your contribution to this important fund over and above your membership allows us to keep bringing you the very best television on television. And that's why it's important that you give to the WGBH annual program fund now before December 31st. So please rush your extra gift right now to WGBH Boston 02134 or call 492-1111 and thank you. This is Channel 2 Boston. Major funding for the Woodwright Shop is provided by State Farm Insurance Companies. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Additional funding is provided by this and other public television stations. This is the spinning and weaving shop at Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia. And I want to stop here because inside this building is the perfect four harness weaving loom that you and I can spend the next two weeks building together in the Woodwright shop. Well, here's the loom and here's Max Hamrick. He's one of the weavers here in the Department of Historic Trades at Colonial Williamsburg. And he's working on this four harness counterbalance loom, a reproduction of an 18th century Virginia loom. You should see why it's called a four harness counterbalance loom, because the four harnesses here, they separate different groups of the threads in the warp, and they're counterbalanced here, controlled by foot treadles that give you the different patterns in the weave, and that's what he's doing right here, throwing the shuttle through the opening in the threads, and then beating it with the beater or reed that's suspended from the top of the frame of the loom. Now, of course, the frame of the loom has to be very, very sturdy. It's not just complex machinery. It also has to be very stout to keep an even tension on the thread. So we've got a cloth beam down here with a ratchet and pawl, and the back is controlled by this lever and a heavy warp beam. Now, it's a lot of work, a lot of framing, and we're going to do it in two episodes. So a lot of work to do. We better get started. Well, look how much we've got done already. Now you can see, doing this out of yellow pine instead of white oak, and that doesn't make it very much easier. Uh, one of the things we want to see is, of course, how to do the brace joint here. Now, instead of being a common mortise and tenon that joins the rest of the timbers together, we've got brace mortise and tenons that have to join at a 45 degree angle. So we're going to see how to do that. And, of course, it got to see how to square up the stock and make the octagonal stock. And it's a lot of work. But I have found two wonderful labor-saving devices just for this job. And here they are right here. This is Whit Whitson. Whit's working on the pine. How's it going? It's going fine. Good, good. And here is Rachel Underhill, and you're working on the, what is that, sweet gum? Sweet gum, yeah. that's right. She's working on the octagonal cloth roller, uh, the one that uh, supplies the uh, warp before it goes to limit. Anyway, this has got to be a big octagonal piece. Now, Whit, have you been checking the square on yours? Yeah. How's it doing here? All right, you there check you that? All right. 
Hold this to try square and you hold it up to the light and so hold it up right there and see if there's any light showing on there. See, you're high on that side, so that's where you got to plane, right there. Now, one of the things, wait, have you noticed this? It's easier to plane on the lines like that than it is on these kind of uh, rough, flat areas like that. Have mm -hmm. you noticed that? Yeah. Yeah, that's the quarter grain. So you go ahead and plane on that and get these down. See, I'm paying these folks to uh, uh, do this work for me. That's all squared up, but now this octagon here, uh, Rachel and I, we started with a big log here. Now, this is the sweet gum. You want to... Here, tell you what, Rachel, let me show you, show everybody how we did the squaring up. This is a problem. You start with a log, and remember, Rachel, we talked about what uh, points in the same direction at both ends of the log? Yeah. All right, what is it? Gravity. Gravity, that's right. All right, so what we can do to g define a plane on a round log, I mean, there's no uh, flat side, so what you do is, of course, you put a level on one end and wait till the bubbles level like this, all right, and then you mark a line across it. Right. And take the level, put it on the other end, and watch the bubble level. Is that level? Mm -hmm. Right there like that. All right, and that defines the plane on both ends. Now, of course, you can use a plumb bob, or you can take two sticks and sight them like that. But anyway, that's how we did it. Now, the big trick, though, is to get to the octagon. And here, Rachel, let's get the toolbox. Let me show you how to do this. Scoot on down here, because this is a... Come on down here. This is an arithmetic trick you have to do. When you do an octagon, where did I put the device? Here they are. All right. Do an octagon. Now, here I've got an eight-inch timber, and I want to do, you know how many sizes does an octagon have? Eight. Eight, right, like an octopus. So what you do, and this is not instinctive, what you have to do is take the uh, diameter here, or the, the not the diameter, but the eight-inch thing, and pace off, set your dividers so that they pace off five divisions here. Now, see, I've got to add a little bit more. I'll add one-fifth of the error. All right, let me go back again and pace off one, two, three, four, five. Well, anyway, and now I have to go back a little bit. Nevertheless, get it so that it's at five, and then use that distance to go from that cross that you've done. And see how that goes to here? This will go to here, all right? And see, that's, that's, this should actually be two paces here. But in any case, from the cross where you've done there, just pace out that one-fifth of the dimension and again, right here, one-fifth over. It's actually 0.2008 or something like that in there and there. And then you connect those, and that's how you get your octagon. So it's a little trick you have to know. You've got to do your arithmetic. Now, we want to put a snap line on this, don't we? Yeah. All right. You want to do that end? Wait, could you help me down at this end? All right. Sure. What we're going to do is snap the lines now because we're making octagon timber out of this uh, round sweet gum. We're on the way there. I've got my old uh, chalk line. Now, Rachel, you can slip this into that little notch right there, and you hold it right there. And with, I'm going to give you this end. Right, we've got some blue chalk this time. And you hold it down there. Now, one thing, when you do the chalk here, uh, what can you scoot back just a little bit so I can see this end? There you go. Now, you want to hold it right over that end, like, like that. Right. And one thing, when you run your chalk, don't drag the chalk straight into it and cut lines through it. Instead, put your thumb on top of it and drag through the side. And what that does is that cuts off the surface of the chalk instead of gouging holes in it, and it'll last a heck of a lot longer. And there we go, right on down. Rachel, you and I saw where chalk comes from. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, it went to the top of the Isle of Wight, and of course, that there's just chalk. It's just uh, fossil seashells kind of stuff. Now, pull tight, real tight width, down at this end. Now, what we want to do, we're defining a plane that's not, we're not going, defining a plane that's in this direction. We're defining a plane that's one of the bevels. And it's important to snap in the same line of the plane that you're defining. So, Rachel, what I want you to do yeah. is sight and see that I'm doing that. You tell me when I've got it right. All right, am I right? Yeah. All right, I'm defining this, pla this plane here. So, I want to be in line with that. And I'm ready? Yeah. Okay, here we go. All right, and that should have snapped it. Now, what this will do is that'll cover for any irregularities in this surface. If Rachel has not been very accurate in leveling this top, snapping in that plane will make it accurate. All right, let's do the lower one. Again, the same thing. Real simple job here. I'm going to chalk it from the back. There we go. Try and drag across the surface of the chalk rather than eating it up. All right, pull it tight. And Rachel, you sight. And tell me when I've got it now. 
A little lower. A little lower. Okay. Like, like that. Hold it wet. Bam. All right, now we've got it. Now, what we're going to do is, here, Whit, you can do it first. Uh, go ahead and roll up the, ch the line. What we're going to do is now notch this. And that's going to help us to add this away. Now, we've worked a little bit more on this. I'm going to do the first one here. And then, Whit, I'll let you do the... Oh, Rachel, good. Sit on it, if you would, and that'll hold it down. All right. What we're going to do is saw from cut to, from line to line. And we'll do that all the way down. Sweet gum is real uh, gnarly wood, and this will make it easier. All right, now, wait, now it's your turn. You go ahead and grab the saw there. I'll help you do that end. There you go. You do it by yourself? Do it by, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I got ran you over. Messed up. All right, that's good. All right, Rachel, you want to do the next one? Okay. And I'll sit on it here. Okay, wait, you can get back to your planning, I guess. I appreciate it. And Rachel, you do this last one. Saw it right there. All right, and this notching will make it real easy. This is the equivalent of, of notching in when you're hewing with an ax. Except what we're going to do is use an adz on this one. There you go. And so we'll do this all the way on down. There you go. Thanks a lot. All right, I'm going to why don't you scoot on back here, because, Rachel, I'm going to do some with the adz right now and trim this off and this adds of course is not a good tool for young people uh, this is the ads right here this is a shipwright's ads and it's got the lips on it as you can see see how that's done it's got lips for doing cross grain real well and i'm going to start adding away down to the line which has disappeared on this side hasn't it well i'll just cut to the bottom of the saw marks but i think we've planed off the line, but that does a pretty good job, doesn't it? Trimming right on down to it. So, I'm just, oh good, and that's not going to look too good. But this has got to be real smooth. This has got to be a very smooth timber here, because this will have all the threads wound onto it to start the weaving. And actually, they'll be, they'll be pretty well clear of it, but Nevertheless, good idea to have it smooth and finished looking. All right. Now, I get the uh, slick here. Did you know this was called a slick? Mm -mm. You didn't? All right. The slick is just like a plane, except it hasn't got a body to it. We'll work the slick down the bevel here. And it's just like a plane, really, is all it is. Just a giant chisel, but it has a lot of inertia to it and that inertia guides it straight on through. It can scoot across the wood and take off pretty big chunks at a time. So it's very similar. It's like halfway between an adz and a plane. Oh. Well, I need to say something. Rachel, where's your little plane? It's right here. Here, would you try that on that bevel and tell me if you like it. Has this been a good plane for you to use? Yeah. Try it out here. But try down the bevel. Can you do down the bevel right here? Yeah, what I'd do is cut down diagonally like that. Oh, okay. And I see, and you can adjust it. And the reason I'm showing you this, I think this kind of plane is real good for young people because it's very lightweight and it's got adjustments with the thumb screws on it that make it easy for young people to adjust. And I was thinking of inertia, that lighter plane. Try it on the surface again. Try Top. it on the surface, right here on the flat. But anyway, has it been working good for you? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. All right, well... They're going to work on that. I'm going to go ahead and get on the, the bevel joint. And I think it's a big thing. I always hear people talk who, who do this kind of work. I say, oh, well, you know, my uh, power equipment is just the same as an apprentice back then. But of course, a tremendous difference. Uh, an apprentice doesn't get any kind of, uh, a machine doesn't learn anything from working with the, the wood. And the young people starting out, of course, the, the things they learn about wood now it's going to last them a lifetime, and so you, you win some and you lose some when you substitute power equipment for the apprentices and the young people get to work with you. Anyway, enough preaching. Let me go ahead and take this apart and see how this joint goes. And back here is a regular mortise and tenon the joint, you can see how that goes, and that'll have to be pegged. Up front here, though, is a... Uh, 
is the bevel mortise and tenon. You can see that's what we have to do. I'm going to take out this bottom end down here that's working loose. Let's see what quality we have. There you go. And there's the mortise and tenon. It goes into a similarly shaped pocket, the uh, mortise right there, and the tenon goes into it. Let's go ahead and cut the mortise first. I've got some of the wood for that. And I think, where have I put it? Here it is. If it were a snake, I wouldn't have been looking for it. And I've laid it out as I have with the rest of these timbers uh, with uh, using a double tooth marking gauge. And let's see where I have, I got that. Got everything in my trug here. Got a trug full of tools. And I'm using an inch and a half mortise here. And you can see the, the, the gauge, of course, has the two teeth that are adjusted just for that width. Now that's exactly the width of the auger that I'm going to use to bore in the holes to make the mortise here. And of course, this will also mark the tenon as well. But anyway, you can see it has an adjustable fence there. Tighten by that screw and just mark the two marks. And all these are marked from one face side, a consistent side here that will always be the face. And so this is a constant distance. This is a constant distance. This varies according to the thickness of the wood. And I straighten that out later, just because that's the way I like to work. Well, I'm going to go ahead and bore the hole. I'm going to use a mortising machine, a boring machine, actually, not a mortising machine, but a boring <laughs> machine, one of the more interesting machines to be called a boring machine. And it makes the job a lot easier. Now, what I'm doing, I have to square it up. I take the square, because this is an adjustable one, adjustable angles, set the square right up against the guide, and then tighten it up here. See, because you can cut angles, holes in this, and that's sometimes you need to do that. Look at this front one. There we go. Ah, all right. Now, we're going to bore two holes. Let me make sure I'm on the right end. Am I on the correct end? No, I am not. I want to pivot this around. Always happens. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's going to be the outside, because one of these ends is, is tapered. And boy, you sure don't want to mess it up on a big piece like this. There's not much you can do with it. This is some wonderful wood I got. I went out to the uh, uh, brothers that run the mill nearby here and trying to find something just like this. The odds of finding it are pretty slim, but it just seems to happen. Every time I go out there, somebody else has ordered something and uh, they never came back to get it. This was some a boat builder ordered this very good quality um, yellow pine here and never came to get it. And you can see I'm boring in. Now what I'm doing, I'll, I'll show you in a second. I've got a little gauge on the top of this thing that I'm watching. But I just crank on down and you can see all the, the gears turning and that gives me a mechanical advantage. And I'm gonna make the mortise uh, actually two and a quarter inches deep because the tenon's gonna be two inches. And let's see, I'm just about there, two and a quarter. There we are, all right, I'll just show you. Let me swing this around so you can see it. There's actually a little uh, ruler line right here. Very handy machine. This one just has a ruler line right here, and I just watch to where it's the right depth on the ruler when the uh, a little carriage that holds the auger hits that point. I stop. Now, on more expensive ones, uh, that would be automatic. and. You just simply set a little stop right there, and what that does is that kicks over an elevator wheel. So I've got one right here. See a little elevator wheel? I kick that over into here, and that engages a rack, which you can see right here, and that cranks up the rack and withdraws the whole thing. On the expensive ones, that'd be automatic. <laughs> Nevertheless, I've got a nice hole right there in the timber, and of course, this frame makes it very, very accurate can bore the second hole, and they're both going to be at right angles. Well, you can see how I do it. I'll just go ahead and bore the hole on in, chase this mortise right on down into the wood. And again, oh, I'm just watching in the auger. My timber's a little bit too narrow for this thing to seat properly on here. I'm kind of running all over. And the kids love to use this kind of thing, but they've got to be a little older. You have to be about 14 before you're strong enough. Here goes the 
elevator. Strong enough to use one of these things, but boy, do they save you a lot of trouble. Now, there we go. Got two round holes. Isn't that nice? Two round holes. And of course, what we want to do is square them up because we want to have square corners here and here. And just for that purpose, there is a tool called a corner chisel. Here you see it. It's a corner chisel. It's shaped like a piece of angle iron, and it will cut right at that corner. Let me get my mallet. And I'm going to use it in these corners and then bevel down on the back side here. So, kind of got it like that. And just drive that right on down. There's the first corner. This will be the second corner. Now, because this hole I'm drilling was an inch and a half, a three-quarter inch face on this fits right to the middle and is, is just what you want to have. Need to trim back a little bit better. In other words, a bigger corner chisel is not an advantage in this situation. You usually want a corner chisel that's exactly half the diameter of the auger hole that you bore. Get this one here. There. All right. Now, we'll use a regular, just a plain old mortising chisel for the sides. There we go. Knock out the roundosities of the sides of the hole. Trim it down. All right, now I'm going to start coming down this way and just cut a bevel, because remember, we're cutting a beveled mortise. So I'll just walk my way back, cutting that beveled. See, and I've got the bevel of the chisel actually facing down. Again, a three quarter inch chisel instead of an inch and a half wide chisel. And that works fine. Now bevel up to make it track down in a little better. And we're going to have it in just scant seconds. It'll take a little bit of trimming. And then we'll see how to do the angled tenon. Just ain't a whole lot of complication to cutting a sloping hole in your wood. Main thing is, is to make it tight so that the joints fit right and to do what Witt was doing at the beginning, which is square up your stock to begin with. All right, so let's see how that's cleaning up. And again, the, the more even grain the pine, the easier this kind of joint is going to be to cut because you can rely on that grain to do a lot of the work for you. And I think, yes, I think I've about got it. But you think I've run out of funny chisels to use? Mm -mm. Got one more. We picked up uh, when we were traveling. I said the Isle of Wight. Well, right across the Isle of Wight, a little town called Bosom in England. And Rachel and I were wandering in there. And we found this little tool shop. And they had a swan neck chisel. And this is what it is, a swan neck chisel. Uh, just is a, like a lever chisel. It'll reach down into the bottom of the mortise and allow you, let me tilt this up here, allow you to crank down into it. You'll see how this will lever against the backside and work the bottom of the mortise. So, a neat thing. You can work down inside just like that. And you end up with a very clean angled mortise for your joint. Well, let's check the cutting the tenon is the same thing except more complicated. Because <laughs> what we have to do, of course, lay it out with the square. And how are you going to cut a 45 with a square? Well, what you do is lay even points. It can be a 10, what well, doesn't matter. But then get the other arm of the square and lay it here so it also crosses at the 10 point. So I've got one here, 10, and the other here, a 10, down at the other end. And when those two cross at the same point, of course, that's on a uh, right angle, you've got a 45 exactly right here. And that's how I cut that angle. All right, then add two inches to that. All right, and that's the depth of the tenon that you see right there, two inches right there. And this, of course, comes off at a right angle, and that gives you the tenon. Now, that depth, that little tongue that's left in there, of course, is laid out again using the marking gauge. See, that double tooth marking gauge, just running it around will give you the definition of size that you need in order to make a mortise and tenon that should fit together. Let me see if I've got it here. I'm going to turn this end around here and that should fit just perfectly in there. All right, there you go. That's your mortise and tenon joint. A little bit of trimming right there. 
and then you can see how I've got to bring those sides flush. That's what I was talking about, the extra. But on the other side, it's dead flat. So there's your mortise and tenon uh, joint. Let me go ahead and put this back in the top, and we'll see real quickly about how to draw bore these joints. Now I'm going to go ahead and get my tool basket here, bring it over, and put this brace back in the top, if I can remember which end goes where. Let's see, that'll go up there like that. So again, your, your other mortise and tenon joints, just cut them uh, the same way as I did these, except less complicatedly. There you go. You can see it's just a straight one. This comes down. Now, very heavy, very good wood. And you're thinking, do I have to use such good wood? Well, you're making something you're going to use for the next 200 years, so you might as well go ahead and get out the good stuff. Now, you got the wit, Rachel, why don't you come over here? Let me show you how to do this draw board joint. Uh, what you got to do is here. Now, you know the mortise and tenon. Come on over, Whit. I'm going to need you to help hold this. What you do is bore the hole through the cheek of the mortise. You know how we got the mortise? Well, that doesn't go all the way through the tongue that's in here. Let me knock it apart and you'll see. But before I do that, I'm going to put the auger back in. You see this? Put the auger back in and crank it once. Now, I'm going to make sure, of course, that it's tapped up tight. And make sure that it's, the joints are square. And then bore in here. Now, this is an easy way to do it. I'm going to show you the easy way. Put your, hole, your auger bit back in the hole and crank it down. All right, now what we'll do is knock it apart. So hold on to that wit. All right, wit, move your head back a little bit because I got to swing. All right, you're doing all right. All right, Rachel, keep the back from tipping over on us. And what you're going to find is there we are. Hang on to it now. I'm going to just hold it on our knees. What you're going to find is that that has left a mark. You can see right there, very, very faintly, the little mark that's left when the auger bit screw went in to the wood. Now, what you do is offset that hole by about what you think is right, uh, about an eighth of an inch, just a little bit short of a quarter of an inch is what you need to do, and then rebore that hole All right. closer to the shoulder of the tenon. Because remember, I've been going on about precision, yeah. how to make this precise? Yeah. Well, what you do here is you have a deliberate inaccuracy that will draw things together. So by offsetting this towards the tenon, you will see that when we drive a peg through, it will pull it together. Because that's the whole thing with this frame. There we are. It has to be very, oh, has to be very, very sturdy so that it will pull together. Now, let's see. I'll drive that up. are offset but when we put the peg in it'll draw them into alignment and pull the joint as tight as it can be and we'll draw bore our joints now see how tight that's getting right there so this makes it very very tight and again the same heart pump thanks well, listen you guys if we're going to finish this for your mom you better get back to planning so okay let's, we're going to finish up next week we'll see how to do the rest of the frame and uh, finish this thing up and hope to get the weaving but in the meantime, thank you for joining me. This has been a